Hello, welcome to Security Insights. I'm Gunnar Peterson, CISO at Forder, which is a trust platform for digital commerce. And today, my guests are Liz Zalman and Jerry Newman, uh, authors of a brand new book uh, on founding, founding a company and investing in a company and investing in founders. And was, I read the whole book. I can't recommend it highly enough. If you're somebody who invests in tech companies, if you're somebody who's founding a tech company or wants to found a tech company, wants to hear the hard-won lessons learned on both sides and and maybe even figure out how these two disparate viewpoints can come together and, and create something great. Uh, I think you're really going to enjoy today's discussion. So uh, Liz Zalman's an infrastructure information security expert. She's a two-time founder, a CEO of venture-backed companies, building the first to successful exit and the second to a multi-hundred million dollar business. Liz has raised more than a hundred million dollars in venture capital from some of the world's most renowned investors. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Newman's been an investor and early stage advisor to groundbreaking technology companies for more than 25 years. He's been called one of New York's 50 most important VCs by Business Insider. He also teaches innovation entrepreneurship at Columbia. That's, I, I think, someplace in New York as well, Jerry, if I'm not mistaken. Where? Um, so let, let's dive into the let's let's dive into uh, both your background and the and what led you to this book because the book really tries to explore and, from my perspective anyway, resolve some of the tension of, between founders and investors. And I want to dive into the book, but before we do that, could you could you talk about really the your two individual unique perspectives, because that's at the heart of the book, I think, is there's the investor is looking through one set of lenses, the founder is looking through a different set of lenses, but ultimately, um, both of them need to be need to be engaged. And and maybe as you're, you're talking about the background that led you to this book, I guess I have a follow on question, which I'll just ask right out of the gate. It feels like, you know, being a VC, being a, a tech founder could be a full time job for a lot of people. Um, how did you decide, hey, I want to you know, write a book in addition to my in addition to my day job? And maybe Liz, we'll start with you. Sure. So so my background is startups. I think my first job out of out of school was for a startup. So I don't think I've ever worked for a large company. Um, and so I've started, I've started two companies. One was, uh, my first one was acquired. And my second one is, is still going. Um, and I met Jerry because he was an investor. I think the first, one of the first investors in the first one, and certainly the first, um, in the second one, uh, strong DM. And I'll let him do his introduction. Cause I actually think he tells the story of how the book came to be the best. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, my, my back. I was an engineer as, as background, and then uh, ended up doing venture capital uh, in the '90s. And then when I left there, I became a founder. So I was a founder for a little while, and then when I was fired by my board, uh, along with the rest of the management team, and uh, went and started back into venture capital to back uh, people, starting with the people who worked for me. Um, so I think you know, I, I I have been on both sides. I've been an investor now for a while, about 15 years. So I think I uh, have gone over to the dark side, so to speak. Um, you know, we one of the founders I worked with was fired, and uh, I wrote a blog post that said, you know, look, founders, boards fire people. Um, you just you need to know that you need to know how to deal with your board of directors so that you don't get fired. Um, put it out on the uh, on my blog. Um, hit the top of Hacker News, which is unusual for my blog. My blog is usually read mainly by venture capitalists. Um, and uh, and I got a lot of um, email from venture capitalists who were concerned that uh, I was taking the wrong side, um, that I was perhaps telling founders things that they that would prejudice them against venture capitalists. Um, and uh, I got a lot of email from founders saying, hey, this was really useful, thanks a lot. And one of them was Liz who emailed me and said, hey, you know, this is good information why isn't there more of this? And I said, because the people that I actually rely on to do my job, the other investors uh, are not happy with me now. Um, and she so said, well, we should write a book. So we decided to write a book. Um, and yeah, we. <laughs> I have a day job. I have a couple day jobs. I have the investing day job and the teaching day job. 
Um, and uh, so I took on a third day job because why not? I mean, you know. One of the best pieces of writing advice I ever got was it was heighten the contrast, which I, I got from uh, Dan Gear gave me that advice a long time ago, which I like many of the things I learned from Dan Gear stayed with me for a long time. And um, I, I think one of the things I appreciated about your book, Founder versus Investor, is is that you really heighten the contrast between those views. You feel when you're reading the founder section, you feel like you're a tech founder not you know doing a belly crawl through the mud with a you know a knife between your teeth kind of thing when you when you when you're reading the investor section you, you feel like you're doing the maybe the cool analytical work from uh, lake como saying hey founder work harder you know that sort of thing um and i think you you kind of get both perspectives really well as an outsider though um the word versus seems like kind of an odd choice from a on a first blush because if you look at an outsider, you might say, geez, shouldn't the founder and the investor, you know, be working together all the time and, you know, marching down the aisle arm in arm? Is that, is that not the case? And like, and what, what, what do you think about the word versus in there? That's obviously a very intentional choice and a theme that runs throughout the the book. Really? Well, go ahead. Let's... Joke. It was really on the, do the only domain that wasn't taken. Yeah. <laughs> all SEO all the time, you know, Gunner, it's about selling a product. <laughs> well, let let's start with uh let's start with trust. The investor has to trust the founding entrepreneur to deliver the goods, right? But Liz, you wrote that the founder is really trusting themselves. The bet of the founder is really on themselves. It seems like the founder needs to trust that they have the right investors on board as well. So it's it's trusting themselves, but also trusting that they have the right investor base set up. Yeah, I think, and actually just to go back to your point about the verses for a second, the, the book is purposefully discussing the things that founders and investors um, disagree over throughout the life cycle of a company. And one of Jerry's conditions for writing the book with me was that we wouldn't actually take a side, we would take both sides. So there is really very limited middle ground in this book. It, you read it, right? We go back and forth and we debate about why each side does what they do. And the hopes is that if founders and investors understand each other a little bit better, then perhaps there's gonna be less strife because less strife means fewer companies blowing up and destroying value for both of those folks and all the employees that worked on it. Um, yeah, I think that there's there's plenty of books that write about the things that founders and investors agree on, um, right? And those are the not the easy things, but everybody's like, yeah, this is how you build a company. This is how you you know sell your product. This is product market fit. All these things that people really shy away from talking about the things where founders and investors disagree. So we decided to focus on that um, because we think it's just as important. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think what's underneath both of the perspectives, if I, and I'm oversimplifying a bit, uh, you know, it's a couple hundred pages. So if you really have to buy the book and read the book to understand uh, th this question, but I guess I'd say, if I look at the versus construct from, from the different lenses, you know, the, in, in some sense, the vendor, the investors trying not to be wrong as compared to the founder who's trying to be right a lot of the time. Um, partially because I think the founder may have more control, at least for some time point in time. And Jerry, you shared a great story on uh, on clickable clothing. And I've I've observed some of my favorite people to work with over the years are people who work the hardest to break their own ideas, and they're and they are the hardest on their own ideas, harder than anybody else before they present them to anybody else. And uh, I think that is a minority sport still to this day. And maybe you could share a little bit about that that clickable clothing story and what you you think you know founders and really anybody in technology probably needs to needs to learn from that. Yeah, you know, and I think you're right. Investors do try very hard not to be wrong, and I think it's because we can't know what's going to be right. I mean, nobody knows what the future looks like. So if you can't know what's right, you can at least whittle away the stuff that's going to be wrong. And it's you know it's it's not hard to say like, oh, this idea is just not going to work. Um, Whereas, you know, I, I kind of divide everything that comes into my inbox into two piles of so things that aren't going to work and things that might work, you know, and so I try to at least avoid the half that's not going to work. 
Um, you know, and and the clickable clothing. This is it's just an idea that I've seen since 1998, at least. So you know, 25 years now. Um, People really seen... want to click on their clothing, some or well, or they think they do. Founders think they do, or, or there are some founders who think who think that this is like the thing, right? Like you're watching a video and you're like, oh wow, I love that shirt. I'll click on it and it'll take me to a store. Um, and this actually seems like a good idea to me too. Like I'll watch, you know, some movie. I'll be like, wow, you know, he looks good in that shirt. I wonder who made that shirt. I mean, I thought that. I don't usually think that. Um, but <laughs> I, you well, know, and, and, so I was what? on. Sorry, I was watching Wimbledon or something this year, and Venus Williams was on the sidelines, and she was in this super cute cardigan that was green, with little tennis rackets all over it, and I was like, oh my god, I need this cardigan. And after much exhaustive googling. I realized that it was Venus Williams's own clothing line and it was a cardigan yeah. from the prior season that was totally sold out. So I had to add myself to a wait list and wouldn't it have been easier if I had just been able to click? Totally, right? It sounds like such a good idea. And so my problem with the idea is not that it doesn't sound like a good idea or that it's not, doesn't seem like logically like, well, of course everybody would love that. It's just that I've seen, you know, a dozen people try to start that company and they've all failed. So the question is why? Why have they failed? And I don't know why, because I didn't invest in any of them. Um, and then once a company disappears, it sort of disappears and, you know, its lessons are gone. But if you're going to start a company in that space, I want you to find the people who tried to start that company and failed and find out why. Because I'd like to know why uh, before I invest in a new company that, you know, at least the base rate says is going to fail. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to fail if you try it, but if you don't know why everybody else failed, then you're probably going to fall into one of the pitfalls they fell into. So just yeah, that, do your research. You know? It resonates so well with me. And I, one of the things I, in, in my little world of cybersecurity, one of the things I'll, I'll always ask and, and frequently get greeted with blank stares from, from tech founders is if, if your solution was so easy, why didn't, you know, why didn't that get baked in by Bill Gates in 2003? Right. It's not like he didn't take the entire team of Microsoft and try and solve security and it, Still seems to be a problem today. So I, I wonder if the reasons, the knock-on effects are are really where some of the most interesting failures and successes are. Liz, you, you described a methodical approach to something a lot of people only really understand loosely, which is defining a value proposition um, is really a mix of both story and numbers. Um, so it's sort of like a, a, a narrative part of your brain meets the numbers and that's where that's where I think that, you know, the valuation work lies and the interesting opportunities lie. Um, and I, one of the things I really enjoyed is that the story early on may actually have more rigor than the numbers in a lot of cases. And you, t you tend to sort of fool yourself maybe and think, uh, not you, but people might tend to think that the numbers are more, uh, more precise. But early on, that the opposite could very well be the case. How do you think about building the story and you know, when you're carving your TAM in the early days and, and you know, how do you avoid pitching what I think you call birthday candle companies, uh, as you so memorably put it in the uh, in, in your book? I think this is one of the main places where, where early stage founders fall down. I mean, Jerry's fond of saying that he's he's zero stage. He invests when it's <laughs> it's two people and an, an idea. And he certainly did that in my my second company. Um, I, I think one of the things that a founder has to do well when they're fundraising or, or when they're selling, quite frankly, is they need to tell a story. And I think you can probably craft the story in a few ways. You can um, evoke that the world is, is falling down. Literally, the world is on fire and my solution is going to save it. Or more aspirational, I believe in this future vision. And how can you not believe in this vision? Because of course, it's going to come to bear if you follow this very logical chain of thoughts that I'm going to lead you through. Um, and and Gunnar, I'd argue it's the same thing in, in security sales, like Strong Game was an infrastructure access proxy, right? So if I were to sell that to you, I would sit there and I would say, why are you doing things this way? And you tell me exactly how you are managing access to infrastructure today. And you'd go down a very long list of steps that that you take. And you've you, there are reasons probably for why you do many of them. And then I would say, look at what your future could look like. And it's the same thing in fundraising. And so I think um, early on, that's the power that the founder has, is, is selling a vision, selling a dream. And then later on, Series A, certainly Series B, definitely Series C, it's about, it's about churn and it's about 
CAC and it's about LTV and it's about all of the things because at that point it's, is this a business that I want to invest in that's going to scale on its way to IPO in a way that's going to ultimately make money in the public markets. But let's talk a bit about the next phase. The stories, this, and, and the book is laid out really, you feel like you're participating in the life cycle of a growing company, which is which is really exciting and, and taking the slings and arrows along the way for sure. And how do you navigate those? But let's fast forward a bit to the growth and scaling part of, of the business. And a, a person who, who founded a couple of interesting companies once told me, that the company life cycles are interesting because they're fun for different kinds of people at different stages of their maturity. Um, and, you know, the list of companies that went from zero to 50, a hundred million dollars in revenue is pretty short. Uh, the list uh, that goes to 500 million or billion is, is, is even shorter still. And so some of this I think is driven by the changing dynamics that you outline in the book, like going from revenue as a company, metric uh, that people focus on to something maybe like operating profit or or cash flow or uh, changing capital intensity in reinvestment and so on. Do you have some favorite examples? And I'll, I guess I'll throw it to both of you. Uh, any favorite examples of companies that either did or did not navigate uh, these shifts? In other words, they played an, you know, an excellent uh, opening 10 moves of the chess match and carried it all the way through like a Mozart or maybe some that played a great first 10 moves and then blew up on, on move 12. Yeah. I mean, I have examples of companies failing at each stage <laughs> after, <laughs> you know, that's uh, the life of venture capitalists, right? But, um, you know, I think for me being an early stage investor, the, the, the first hurdle is always, can you go from being really a team of you and, you know, a couple of your friends um, to hiring people who will, are going to take your job away from you, or at least part of your job away from you. And I think some people find that really hard. You know, I had, uh, there's an example in the book about a company where the founder, <laughs> it was interesting when I first met him, he's, he was, um, he bragged that they were saving money by, he was building his own servers uh, as opposed to buying servers. And I said, <laughs> you know, you can save money doing it that way, but may that might not be the best use of your time. Um, but you know he he wouldn't hire anybody. He wouldn't hire some. He wouldn't hire people to go talk to customers to talk to the other employees. And he wasn't a very communicative person, being an engineer. And so one of my conditions before I invested was, look, you got to hire somebody to be like your COO. And we went through this. Um, he said, yeah, yeah, no, I've got a person I, uh, I'm thinking of. I just need the money so I can you know pay them a salary. So I invested. And then for a year he didn't hire somebody. Um, kept saying he was talking to people, hadn't found the right person, blah blah blah. Um, and after a year, the board of directors decided to take over the search for the COO because it had he had become the person who was blocking the growth of the company. Right? The company couldn't grow because he had to do everything. So, you know, we took over and we found somebody um, and hired them. And then he quit because he was worried we were trying to replace him. And we weren't. We were just trying to get somebody in there to help him grow, um, grow the company. So, you know, you, you have these things where people who are really good at doing something often hate letting go of doing it. Right. So, and, and becoming the manager of the people who do it. Uh, that, that ties in, that, that, that ties in really nicely to, to my, uh, my a related question. And Liz, I'd like to hear you on this one too, because it seems like the, the stages of growth of a company um, are something that an investor lens is really helpful potentially with some seasoning to help a, a founder navigate like a resource to say here's here's when things are moving from revenue to to profit as an example but on the other hand maybe in that example where jerry is going embedded in there it's like there's there's operations takes on an increasingly important role at every stage of growth i i think and I kind of think the people who are profiled in this book, founders and investors, are the people that people like to hang out with at cocktail parties. Um, and I've worked with a lot of operations people that are really good. And and frankly, those are not the people always that people want to hang out with cocktail <laughs> parties. At least of the cocktail parties I go to. So I wonder, like, how do those skill sets sort of mesh when you're, you know, two, three, four stages of growth down the road and and 
is is it on the founder to recognize that? Is it on the investor to recognize? Like, how do you how and or do you just assume that you have these unbelievable founders that can, you know, define the TAM and and tell the story and raise the money and build the the product and product market fit and then be, morph into great operations people too? How does that all come together? Uh, and and where does that oper when and where does that operator DNA come in? Liz, Liz do you have any thoughts on that? I have so many thoughts on that, Gunner, and it's it's called the growth chapter of the book. I think, but I'll, I'll touch on a few points. So I think that shifting from a founder to an operator is probably, whatever, all the jobs are difficult. It's one of the most difficult jobs of a founder. And I think more specifically, one of the reasons why, why, why growth was challenging for me, and I think for many founders, is that way back at the beginning of my journey, 15 years ago, Nobody stopped me and said, hey, Liz, by the way, if you do this right, this is what you're going to have to look like in seven or 10 years in order to continue to be with this company or to be the, the person that this company needs if you're going to keep this title or whatever it is. Nobody said that to me. And so one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book is because if a, if a, if a first time founder, a second time founder or first time investor reads this they actually come away being less naive. They understand at a minimum that there's more to this job than they think there is at this moment in time. And in my experience, investors have not leaned in and said, hey, you do a really great job in these areas. You're falling down in these areas. Let's option one, build you up. Option two, get an executive coach. Option three, hire somebody like in Jerry's example to be a management layer below you, You know, four, five, and six. They don't really do that. My experience is that they just sort of assume that you're going to figure it out yourself or like Jerry's blog post says, probably get fired by accident. Um, I also just touching on the personality of, of what a seasoned operator might look like. I got this uh, this text message from somebody that used to work for me at Strongnam. And this person asked if they gave off corporate vibes. And please tell me the truth. Do I give off corporate vibes? And I said, what's the context? And they said, well, I've been out interviewing and the only offer that I got, and this person is an operator. Um, and they said, the only offer I got is from a public company. And I sat on that for a while. And it wasn't that this person gave off corporate vibes. It was that they didn't have sparkle. Their personality was just sort of very flat and metered. And you know, their amplitude was like this. It wasn't like this. And most people at a startup were like this, like, I mean, listen to me, right? I'm gregarious. You want to talk to me at a cocktail party. Um, you don't necessarily want to talk to this person at a cocktail party. And I think founders, as we transition to operators, have a tendency to, to look for people that look like us because we want sparkle. It's so exciting. It's so amazing. And yet at the same time, maybe a stodgy operator who wants to just bury themselves in spreadsheets is exactly what the business needs at this particular moment in time. And so that's the tension that the book describes is what's critical for the business versus where is the founder's head at? So I, I think it sounds like there's gonna be a second uh, a second book then coming after this, right? Onto, onto operations or something. Is that is that uh, a sequel to this book you think? Oh man, I don't, I don't know if Jerry wants to spend another second <laughs> working on the book with me. Well, you know, I, I think in the book, I say that, you know, venture capitalists are not the people you go to for operating advice, right? Because we're only involved in your company, like when at the board meetings, maybe, you know, a weekly call, we can't tell you what to do with the company. You're there 24-7. Um, so I think it's, you know, go, I, I would not be the right person to write a book on operating a company. I've got plenty of opinions, but I don't know, you know. <laughs> So this is a, 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 for my last question, this is a security uh, podcast first and foremost. And I'd like to close by asking, you know, we have so many cybersecurity challenges these days. And I, I think, frankly, founders and investors are one of the keys to uh, to unlocking solutions to the really long, decades long problems we've had in cybersecurity. And we've seen some great examples of of companies being started in the space but we all, everybody here knows there's still an enormous amount left to go. And I, I wonder, having been around tech and, and cybersecurity for a while, do you think there's anything in cybersecurity that makes it especially difficult to establish a moat? Um, a, a friend of mine 
has described to me that cyber is like a fashion show where instead of, you know, walking the, the stage at Milan and Paris, it's, you know, you're walking around RSA, but effectively it's this year's, this year we care about APT and next year we care about zero trust and next year, it's a different fashion every time. Is this unique to cyber in your view, or do you think this is just how most tech startups go or, or is it just hard because it's hard? What are, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, the founder of view and the investor view in, in cybersecurity specifically? You know, investor view, I, I think it's just hard. You know, it's interesting every once in a while at Columbia, some professor will come up with some novel security solution. And, uh, you know, the last time somebody said, oh, we're, we're back to clickable clothing again, right? Well, yeah, well, no, but no, actually in, in this case, Somebody told me, I'm like, oh, I, I would love to talk to him. And uh, the person said, oh, he's already got like venture capitalists banging on his door all day. Um, you know, it's uh, I think if there's if there's a novel solution that really promises something more than we have, people are really pretty eager to explore it. Um, but, you know, the flip side is I think it's it's not easy to sell into that market to convince people that you've got something that's actually going to work. I think from the operator perspective to that, I guess, a few things to say. There are so many companies that touch security in some way, shape, or form that end up getting funded that I think Gunner as a, as a buyer of security products, I think it can be near impossible to separate the weed from the chaff, right? If I came and pitched you, you'd be like, well, how are you different from a VPN or how are you different than WireGuard or blah, 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 right? And I'd have to sit there and, and explain to you and essentially assess my little corner of the industry and help educate you on all the different options that you have out there. Um, the flip side is um, having sold a product into companies and, and one of the triggers for the purchase of StrongDM was SOC 2, for example. Um, so many startups today are reaching for the check mark that SOC 2 gives, right? You're not going to look at, no company is going to look at any startup now that doesn't have SOC 2 or maybe in Europe, ISO 27001. Um, and yet when people go to implement SOC 2, they rarely implement any form of security. It becomes security theater. And so you've got a whole bunch of confetti on the vendor side and you have a whole bunch of confetti on the, on the buying side. And it's um, when it's so difficult to discern truth from reality, um, I think it just adds difficulty to the market. Screenshots will can will continue until security improves. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Liz Zalman, and Jerry Newman, uh, first of all, thank you for your work on Founder vs. Investor. I uh, highly recommend to anybody in the uh, technology and cybersecurity space as a way to uh, avoid a large number of mistakes and also uh, improve outcomes uh, uh, for, in terms of build, building better companies. Uh, thank you again for your time today and uh, all the best to you. Thank you, Gunnar. Thank you.